Uh, hello, everyone. I hope my voice is clear. So let me uh, continue with the, the Jenkins that we were uh, actually discussing. Uh, today's session on Jenkins is going to be a very, very simple concept. We call this as uh, user administration. And uh, what is user administration? It's it's basically the, the process of creating users and giving them permissions on your Jenkins. Okay, that's, that's what we are... Uh, going to discuss in uh, today's class. If you recall, in the first class of Jenkins, when we were uh, trying to do the installations, do you remember? Uh, we we uh, How did the, the navigations flow through? We had something called as Unlock Jenkins. After that, it was asking us to install certain plugins. And finally, it asked us to create an admin user. I hope you remember. Admin user is nothing but the person who has complete control over all the functionalities of your uh, uh, Jenkins. Online candidates, is everyone able to hear my voice? Can you people actually confirm in the chat if my voice is uh, audible? It's audible, right? Yeah, fine, thanks. Okay, fine, That thanks. So see, so the, the, the concept, as I said, is about uh, user administration. In the very first session of Jenkins, when we were trying to install Jenkins, it prompted us to create an admin user. Whatever credentials we have given at that point of time, we were using those credentials all these days to log in into Jenkins. And those credentials are the admin credentials. Admin credentials in the sense, he is the one who has complete control over all the functionalities of your Jenkins. See, as a DevOps engineer, it's perfectly all right that you have complete control or you have all access on your Jenkins. But what happens in a real-time scenario is not only a DevOps engineer, even developers interact with Jenkins, testers interact with Jenkins, so many other teams have something or other to do on Jenkins. Now, when a developer or a tester, for that matter, is interacting with Jenkins, they don't require the same level of privileges that you have. Because we are DevOps engineers, one of our core responsibilities is to work on CICD, Jenkins. Of course, we require access on all the functionalities of Jenkins. But the other team members who also need access, they, they require limited access. They don't need to access each and every functionality of Jenkins, and uh, that's what we are going to learn today, user administration, the ability to create user accounts and give them permissions. When a developer logs in, what kind of permissions he should have? When a tester logs in, what kind of permissions he should have? This is defined by your organization. According to those definitions, we need to give the necessary privileges. That is also one of the responsibilities of a DevOps engineer. I think it's making sense and uh, everyone is understanding. Okay. So let me log in into my uh, Jenkins as always. And uh, I think we have our servers in uh, North Virginia, right? So let me go there. So let's look at the servers. We have uh, these three servers, Jenkins, QA, and Prod, which are currently stopped. Let me start all these three servers. And you people know that once the Jenkins server comes to running status, we connect to the Jenkins server and we need to start the Jenkins service, right? So let me just check it. I mean, I'm just waiting for these uh, servers to come to running status. In fact, you know, the kind of installation of Jenkins that we have learned 
constantly requires you to log in into the server and give this command java hyphen jar jenkins dot war. If someone is not happy with this process, today I'll show you another way of installation of Jenkins where you don't need to do all these things. If you simply start the server, you will notice that your Jenkins is in uh, running condition. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Now, you notice my Jenkins server is available. I'll connect to the server via SSH. I just need to paste that SSH command in my git bash. It'll ask my, uh, my confirmation. Uh, are you sure you want to continue connecting? For which I'll say yes, and that's it. You are connected to the Jenkins server. In this server, earlier we downloaded a file called Jenkins.war. So let me run that file. Java-jar Jenkins.war. That's it. You will notice that your Jenkins server will come into running status. Now, once the Jenkins server comes to running status, how do you access your Jenkins? We, we have done this n number of times. All I need to do is highlight the server, pick up the public IP of your server, and you can give that public IP in your browser in combination with the port number 8080. Now you see, whatever credentials we have been giving here and logging in, these were the credentials that we have used at the time of setup of Jenkins, okay? So these are the admin credentials, which means uh, these the, the person who has these credentials is having unlimited access on Jenkins. He can access each and every functionality. So as a DevOps engineer, I would want to have that kind of access. Now, these are my credentials, which I am giving and logging into my Jenkins. Now, what I want to do is basically, I want... Uh, to create some users and for example i'll create two users the first user name i'll give as hari the next user name let's give as anu hari is a developer and hari should access only the development related jobs anu is a tester she should access only the testing related jobs this is the kind of uh, user administration i want to show as a devops engineer when i log in i should be able to access everything but when a developer Hari is a developer. Okay, just imagine. Hari, when he logs in, he should see only the development jobs. When Anu logs in, she should access only the testing jobs. And most importantly, these other team members should not have access on Manage Jenkins because Manage Jenkins is the, the heart of your Jenkins. It's like your control panel. Once you go into Manage Jenkins, you can do a lot of things. So Manage Jenkins should be controlled by a DevOps engineer like you and me but other team members need not have access on Manage Jenkins. This I want to do. So let's proceed. All you need to do is, currently I am logged in with my credentials. Okay, as a DevOps engineer, you can see on the right corner, it shows my name. So now you go into Manage Jenkins. And on Manage Jenkins, you see there is, uh, if you come into the security section, there is a, 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 you know, a tab called users. Come to the user section and already this is the admin user that we have created at the time of installation of uh, uh, Jenkins. Let's not disturb that. What we do is we click on create user and you give the name of the user. Now, I want the username to be called as Hari. I'll give some password. I'll confirm the password. Let's give Hari's full name. And imagine this is his email ID. Okay, I mean, generally you'll give your organization email. Here I'm just putting some dummy email, okay? Click on create user. You can notice a user called Hari is created. Similarly, I want to create one more user. I'll call this person uh, as Anu. Let's provide her password. Let's give Anu's full name and Anu's email ID. Okay, I'm just giving some dummy data. As I, I told you a few minutes earlier, according to me, Hari is a, a, a developer and Anu is a tester. Okay. Whenever Hari logs in, he should access only the dev development jobs. And whenever Anu logs in, she should access only the testing related jobs. This is what I want to show you. As of now, we just created these users called An Anu and Hari but they have unlimited permissions, which means what kind of permissions I have as a DevOps engineer on Jenkins, 
you will notice that these people will also have same kind of permissions. Let's check, check in, just check that. I will log out of my account. I will log in with Hari's credentials. Do you notice? I have logged in with which username? Hari. And you can see that Hari is also having all the access that I have. And he can also access Manage Jenkins. Similarly, let's log out of Hari's account and ask Anu to log in with her credentials. You Do you see? Currently, we are logged in as Anu user. And you can see that Anu user, which is uh, logged in, also has access on everything, right? What we have done is we just created two users, Hari and Anu. We did not give them any restrictions. So they are able to access everything. My intention is Hari being a developer should access all the jobs which are starting with the word DEV. Anu being a tester should access only those jobs which are starting with the word TEST. And both these people should not have access on this Manage Jenkins. Okay. So in order to do that, I will log out of Anu's account. I will log in with my credentials. As a DevOps engineer, whatever are my credentials, I will log in with these credentials. We'll go into Manage Jenkins and we will install a plugin. You people know how to install plugins on Jenkins, right? How do you do that? You go to the plugin section. Here, go for available plugins. Remember earlier, we installed two plugins, deploy to container plugin, copy artifact plugin. Similarly, on the same lines, today I'm trying to install a plugin called as role-based authorization strategy plugin. See this, when I search for role, automatically this plugin is popping on my screen. Let me click on install. Now, once the plugin is installed successfully, uh, I will go to Manage Jenkins. And in Manage Jenkins, in the same security section, the very first tab is security. Go to security. By default, what Jenkins is saying is, do you see in authorization section, it says logged in users can do anything, which means once a user logs in into Jenkins, he can literally do anything. I don't want that. I want to put restrictions. So I will select this option called role based strategy. After installing this plugin, we are using this option called as role based strategy. And now let's see the difference. If you save this, okay. And if I log out of my account and if I ask Hari to log in with his credentials, you will notice that for Hari, it clearly says access is denied. The same thing you people will see for Anu user also. Just watch, Anu user also is not able to access anything. So I hope you're understanding, but both are extremes because in the first scenario, we noticed that Hari and Anu were having unlimited permissions. And now you notice they don't have any permissions. What I am expecting is I want to give them permissions, but we want to have limited permissions. They should not do everything depending on the kind of project they are working for, only those roles they should be assigned. So for that, I will log in into Jenkins with my credentials as a DevOps engineer. And then I go into manage Jenkins. After installing this plugin called role-based authorization strategy plugin, in the security section, you will get a new option called manage and assign roles. You come to this manage and assign roles. And here there is a section called global roles where there is someone called admin who is having administrator permissions. Administrator means all permissions. I'll create another global role. Maybe I'll call it as employee. And we'll say that, okay, click on add. For employee, what permissions do you want to give? Maybe I'll give read permissions. And maybe in the, you know, in the run section, I will give uh, delete, uh, replay, update, you know, configure in the view section, create, delete, read like this. I mean, don't think that these are random checkboxes that I am clicking according to my interest. No, your organization tells that what kind of permissions employee should have. Accordingly, carefully, you need to pick up those checkboxes. Okay. After that, you go for item roles. In item roles, I will tell there are two roles. One is that of a developer. And developer should access 
dev.starjobs. Developer should be able to access all the jobs which are starting with the word DEV. The dot star is a regular expression, which means after the word DEV, you can have anything. Okay. And uh, click on add. When I click on add, you see that the job is uh, shown here. And a developer should be able to do what? I want to almost give all permissions. So I'll just click on create, delete, manage domains, update. So basically, on the development jobs, I am planning to give almost all the permissions. Again, this is decided by your organization's management, which permissions should be given. Similarly, the next one is that of a tester. For a tester, I will give this one. Anyone who belongs to the category of tester should access any job which is starting with the word TEST dot star, which means after TEST, you can have whatever you want. So see, tester can create, delete, manage domains. Okay, done. Now after this, after working on this, uh, we are done. I mean, on this page, whatever we are supposed to do is over. I can just click on save, apply and save. Now see, we finished our activity on manage roles. Now I want to go into assign roles. Now in assign roles, uh, click on add user. What are the names of the two users we created? One user is Hari and again click on add user. The next user name is Anu. Okay, Hari and Anu, don't put them in the admin category. If you give them in the ad admin category, they will have all permissions. I'll put them in the employee category. We have seen in the previous page, for employees, we have given limited permissions, right? So basically, you are giving that kind of limited permissions, okay? Uh, then you come to this item roles. In item roles, click on add user. Again, specify the names of the two users. One is Hari. Again, click on add user. The name of the next user is Anu. According to us, Hari is a developer. Anu is a tester. Do you see that? For Hari, I have selected developer. And for Anu, I have done tester. We are almost done. Now, if you save this and if you log out and if you ask Hari to log in with his credentials, just watch what is happening. Do you notice? When I log in with the credentials of Hari, you can clearly notice that Hari can access only the development related jobs and you don't see the manage Jenkins and all those components here. Similarly, let's try to log in as Anu user with the credentials of Anu I'm trying to log in. Anu being a tester, she should be able to access only the testing related jobs. Do you see that Anu user can access only the testing related jobs. Even she is not able to access our manage Jenkins, etc., etc. You are understanding. But as a DevOps engineer, when I try to log in with my credentials, you will see that everything is available. See, when I log in with my credentials, you can see that it's showing my name over here. You can clearly see all the jobs are available. Manage Jenkins is available. Everything. Okay. This is what we call as user administration. As an example, I have just taken developer and tester, but you can have other teams also, which might be interacting with Jenkins. So depending on their requirement, we need to identify what are the exact required set of permissions, and we have to give those permissions. And that's it. This is called as user administration. We have performed this user administration using a plugin called as role-based authorization strategy plugin. This is not the only way to perform user administration. Organizations use different types of plugins, like there is something called CloudBeast plugin, matrix authentication plugin. There are different, different ways to do that. Now, when you people are putting some experience and going for an interview, and you say that you have used Jenkins in your previous company, if they're asking you, then how did you do user administration? You can just talk about any one of the ways. What we have seen, you can just explain. You can tell that we used a plugin called as role-based authorization strategy plugin. With the help of this plugin, we used to create multiple users and give them necessary permissions. That is sufficient. Okay.
So I already told this is a very, very simple concept of Jenkins. I just wanted to wind up the basic concepts of Jenkins for today because in the next session of Jenkins, we'll move into advanced concepts like pipelines, etc. The navigations part and all this, which is fundamentals of Jenkins, I just wanted to wind up with today's class. Okay. Now, the, the next one is, uh, we have created these jobs in the last class. Remember, this development job is linked with the testing job. Similarly, this Dev01 job is linked with the Test01 job, right? Now, what I want to do is whenever we want to run a job, for example, look at the development job. It clearly shows that it was executed 23 hours ago. Now, if I want to run it one more time, all I need to do is just click on this build icon and you will notice that the job has started executing for the seventh time. Since the development job is linked with this testing job, automatically, once the development job is over, it will trigger the testing job. Do you notice that? The testing job is already in the build queue. It's waiting to be executed. So, the, wow, something went wrong and the testing job has failed. It's okay. We can actually see what is the problem and all that. But what I'm actually trying to show you is currently, when the jobs are executing, when you are clicking on the build icon, when I'm manually going to the Jenkins dashboard, when I'm clicking on the build icon, the job is getting executed. What I want to do is, let's imagine in your organization, every Friday evening, they run the Jenkins job. Okay, or Thursday, they run a Jenkins job, something like that. So do you think every Friday evening, a DevOps engineer will sit on the Jenkins server and manually click on the build icon? No we will schedule the job for that particular date and time. I hope you are understanding. Rather than manually opening the Jenkins server, clicking on the build icon, what I want to show you now is, I want this job to be automatically triggered at a particular date and time and how to do that. Let's see. Let's say I want to trigger the development job. I go to this development job. Simply, I go to the, the, the configuration uh, page. Now, once I come to the configuration page, uh, do you notice there is a section called build triggers? Come to build triggers and there you have an option called build periodically. All I need to do is click on this and they are asking you the date and time. In the schedule section, you are supposed to give the date and time and automatically this job will be triggered at that particular date and time. How do you give that? All you need to do is click on this question mark. Now, when I click on that question mark, you people will actually notice that they are asking you to specify the minutes, the hours, the day of the month, the month, the day of the week. These are the five parameters we need to pass. What is the exact minute when the job should be triggered? What is the hour? What is the day of month? Which month do you want to run this job? What is the day of the week? Now, our servers are not running in India. Our servers are running in North Virginia. So I need to take the date and time from North Virginia. So see what I'll do. I will just connect to the server. I'll just connect to the server, the Jenkins server, because it's present in North Virginia. I just want to find the date and time. Or you can go into Google and search for date and time in North Virginia. On Linux, there's a command called date, which actually shows you the current server's date and time. Do you see? In North Virginia, it seems it's Wednesday, December 27th, 1327. 13 in the sense, I think it's, yeah, 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock in the afternoon, right? One, It's almost nearing 1.30. 1.30 in the afternoon, that's the time in North Virginia. Okay. Oh, so, uh, it's it's 1.27. Uh, maybe I'll execute it at 1.29 or 1.30, something like that. So, let's go to the Jenkins dashboard. I will say the minutes as 30. Then they are asking you for the, the, the hours in 24 hour format. So we have clearly seen that the hours when shown in, uh, it's showing as 13 hours. So just give the same value, 13 hours, which means in another two, three minutes, I'm expecting the job to be triggered. And, uh, and look at the next things. What is the day they are showing? 27th, because the next one is, okay, day of the month. I'll give it as 27. Which month is it showing? 12. And the day of the week, 0 is Sunday. So 
If zero is Sunday, Monday will be one, two, three. Wednesday becomes three. So three. So exactly, it's already 1329. In another one minute, I'm expecting the job to be triggered. Let us save the job. Go to the dashboard. You see the development job is executed seven times. In a few seconds, it will start running for the eighth time. Automatically it will run. Just check for the date for your, it's 12, to, I mean, it's, it's one, and one in the afternoon, 29 minutes, 32 seconds. So once it becomes 13.30 or 1.30, you will see the job automatically gets triggered. So this is the way of scheduling your Jenkins jobs for a particular date and time. Already 52 seconds. And 58 seconds and done. You see, it's already 1330. Let's refresh the page. Do you notice the development job has automatically started triggering for the eighth time? You understand? This is how you schedule the jobs for a particular date and time. But I have a question for you people before we move into the next topic. When I started with the flow of CICD, we said that this is how we configure. You have a team of developers who are creating some code, pushing the code into the Git repository. The moment code is uploaded, my Jenkins is receiving a notification and Jenkins is downloading the code. It is building the code and we talked about all the stages. So the definition understanding, what we understood is the moment developer uploads the code into the Git repository, my Jenkins will somehow receive a notification and Jenkins will trigger this entire flow of CI-CD. Currently, what is happening? Either you are opening Jenkins dashboard and you are manually clicking on the build icon. That's one scenario. Or you are scheduling the Jenkins job for a particular date and time. That's it. These are the two things that we are currently doing. What I am actually expecting is the moment the developer uploads the code into the Jenkins server, automatically this process of CHCD should be launched. How to do that? Search on Google, come up with a solution. I'm a, I mean, as part of our training, we'll, we'll try to see that also. But before I explain, it's 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 good if you can actually search on Google and do a, do a little bit of R&D. I think everyone understood. The moment the developer uploads the code into the Git repository, automatically Jenkins should trigger this flow of CICD. It's not that you click on the build icon or you schedule the job for a particular date and time. This is what I am expecting. Okay, let's see who will come up with a, a answer. Already Gauri has uh, said that uh, we have webhooks, uh, you know, my data drive. I mean, if you can put your name, it will be really great. He also gave the correct answer. Pole SCM. It's not pull SCM, sir. It's pole SCM. But yeah, what you gave is correct. All these are correct answers. But I, I'll practically show once we go into those uh, concepts. Okay, nice. Fine. The, the last concept I want to talk about for today is some of our students are not happy with the process of Jenkins installations that we are currently doing. Okay. Uh, because what are we doing? On a daily basis, we are connecting to the Jenkins server. We are giving the command java-jar jenkins.war and then only Jenkins is coming into running condition. On the other hand, on the QA server and prod server, when you simply start the server, you people notice that Tomcat is available, right? I can just take the public IP colon 8080 and Tomcat is available. But in the case of Jenkins, simply starting this EC2 instance is not sufficient. We are starting the server. We are connecting to the command prompt. We are connecting to the terminal of the server. And then we are giving a command java hyphen jar jenkins.war. Then only we notice that Jenkins is coming into running status. I want to avoid this. I want to configure or I want to install Jenkins in such a way that the moment you start the server, Jenkins also will be available. No need to connect to the server constantly and give this command java-jar jenkins.war. So alternative way of installation of Jenkins. I mean, Jenkins can be, the installations can be done in any number of ways. Whichever you are comfortable, you can follow that. So I'll delete this older Jenkins server so that I can create a new one. I'm terminating that instance. And I launch a new AWS instance. You people know these navigations. Let me call this server as a new Jenkins server. Uh, as we have been already doing, I am taking Ubuntu flavor of Linux. 
the regular free version t2.micro, select the key pair. Uh, in network settings, what are we doing? We are just changing this currently to all traffic. As part of our AWS training, we'll try to understand all this. And, uh, you know, this is uh, the storage that is given over here. The number of instances we are creating is one server. View all instances. So you will notice that a new Jenkins server is in running status. Actually, I forgot to mention, when we had a demo session, I said that as part of our DevOps training, we will mainly focus on the DevOps part, not on the AWS tools. Do you remember in the demo session, I said that we'll focus only on certain services of AWS like EC2 or ECR, or you know there is something called as uh, Elastic Kubernetes Service. A little bit we'll work on IAM. So a few services only we'll be working on auto scaling. This is what I told. But for the sake of convenience of the students, what we have decided is we have decided to start a, a completely free AWS batch, okay, for DevOps students. And that batch would happen in the morning hours at 10.30 a.m. That's for DevOps students. For the DevOps students, uh, whichever uh, you know uh, time slot you may be coming in, that doesn't matter. Morning 10.30 a.m., we people are conducting a, a free AWS batch that's going to in-depth AWS probably for more than 30 hours. That would be starting somewhere in the uh, the new beginning part of the new year, uh, first week or second week of uh, uh, January. Uh, very shortly, we'll start. So uh, you can avail that opportunity also, both online and classroom. Of course, it's not me. The AWS entire in-depth training would be done by another trainer. If you people are interested, you can uh, attend those sessions also. I mean, it will be an added advantage. You know DevOps and you also know uh, uh, AWS in-depth. Cracking the interview and all those things will become more easy for you. Okay. Anyhow, this is the newly created server, right? So let's connect to that uh, Jenkins server. So see, this is my uh, Jenkins server. Since it's a new server, I'll try to connect to the server from the level of uh, my Git bash. This is a new server where we are planning to uh, understand uh, alternative approach for installation of Jenkins. Okay, now once we are done with this, once we are connected to the server, uh, I, I hope you remember some of these commands. The first thing we do is we update something known as the APT repository. Jenkins is a software which is dependent on Java. So for Jenkins installations to be done, first you need to have Java installed. We have done the same thing earlier also. So I'll give the same commands. Install hyphen Y open JDK hyphen 11 hyphen JDK. This is going to install the required dependent version of Java. Once Java installation is over, it's so simple. All you do is go into uh, your Google and there you'd say Jenkins installation on Ubuntu, right? So this is the official Jenkins documentation. You can click on this link and they are talking about how you can install Jenkins on Debian Ubuntu. This is one flavor of Linux, Fedora Linux or Red Hat, you know, different, different flavors of Linux they have given. In our case, we are interested in the uh, Ubuntu domain. So click on that. Do you see they have given some commands? I mean, it's it's not necessary for you to understand these commands. Basically, the Jenkins keys are downloaded and they are added to the APT repository, after which it's going to install Jenkins. All I want you to do is copy all these commands and paste it in your Ubuntu Linux server. I mean, still uh, Java installation is going on. Once it is done,
Java installations, uh, it's taking a little longer than usual, but it's okay, we'll wait. I mean, earlier when we installed Java, it never took this much time. Now, because Java is installed, as I said, you just copy all these commands and paste them in your uh, Jenkins server. Uh, it will just ask for your confirmation, showing how much storage it will consume. I can just, uh, you know, just say yes over here by typing Y and the Jenkins installation will be done. This kind of Jenkins installation is a permanent installation in the sense if you simply start the server, Jenkins would be up and running. You don't need to connect to the Jenkins server on a constant basis, trigger the command java jar jenkins.war, all that is not necessary. So uh, Jenkins should be installed by now. Let's check it. As you people know, in order to access Jenkins, you always depend on the public IP, right? This is the new Jenkins server. I'll highlight the server, go to the networking section. Let me pick up the public IP. I'll give that public IP in the browser colon. What is the default port number that we have been using? 8080. You people will navigate through the same screens that we have seen earlier. Unlock Jenkins. We know that here a password has to be assigned, uh, given and they are showing you where the password is present. In the root directory, there is a folder called var. In var, there is a folder called lib Jenkins secrets and there is a file called initial admin password. So let's open this file to find the password. We know based on our previous sessions that VAM is used for opening files, right? Creating, etc. So this is the password. Just copy that password, paste it over here and click on continue. The next screen is also something, you know, installation of plugins. Just click on the first option. A few commonly used plugins will get installed. See, I am providing some username. I mean, these are the credentials of your Jenkins admin. Remember, today also I mentioned that in user administration. So whatever credentials you give here, he is becoming the overall controller of your Jenkins. Click on save and finish. So the advantage of this kind of installation of Jenkins is if you stop the server and start it again, simply by starting the server, Jenkins will be available. Let me show it to you. 
I will shut down the Jenkins server. See this, this is the server. I'm simply stopping the server. Okay, no need to connect to the command prompt, nothing like that. So I'm just closing all those things. The server is shutting down. Once it stops, we'll start the server again. And without connecting and without giving the command java hyphen jar jenkins dot war, all that drama is not necessary. Jenkins will be available in running condition. See? The server has stopped, right? So let me start the server again. Okay, once the server is in running status, please watch. I'm simply taking the public IP of the server. All I need to give is uh, give it in the browser colon 8080 and you will notice your Jenkins will actually load. Do you see that? I, I never connected to the server to give the regular command that we have been using. I just gave the public IP colon 8080. It's directly taking me to the login page where I am giving the username and the password through which we are able to log in. So, I mean, they, in this way, there are other types of installations also. You can just go with whatever you want. As part of our Ansible training, we'll see how all this stuff can be automated. No need to do these installations manually. A DevOps engineer will not do these things manually. Since we did not learn Ansible, we are trying to do it manually at this point of time. Once we understand Ansible, we'll automate all these activities, okay? So uh, this is actually a permanent way of installing Jenkins. Permanent in the sense, uh, I mean, the previous one is also permanent, but constantly you need to start the Jenkins. Here, that's not necessary. When you start the server, Jenkins is also available, okay? So I think uh, for today, this is sufficient. Please uh, try to practice this. Okay, we'll upload this uh, video also very shortly onto uh, YouTube. You can actually rewatch the video from there. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, uh, tomorrow uh, we'll continue with a few more concepts uh, related to Git, Jenkins, etc. And uh, yeah, that's it. We we also take a, we'll also take a Linux session. I think uh, it's better that tomorrow instead of continuing with Jenkins, I I will go with one session of Linux. After that, we'll again uh, resume with our flow, okay? So that's how we'll proceed. So tomorrow's session is going to be a Linux session. We already had one Linux class where some of the basic commands we have seen, I want to continue from there. Day after tomorrow, again, we'll continue with our regular DevOps, okay? So I'll wind up the meeting for today. Thank you so much.